What's up guys, Tim Bratz here. Hey, last week I dropped a video regarding a bunch of questions from people on social media asking me about how do I get into apartment buildings, how do I do more deals, how do I raise money, that, that kind of thing. And, uh, and I addressed, I think around, I don't know, a dozen different questions on that. That was only half of the batch. So this week, I'm gonna address the other half of the batch. So let's dive right in and let's do some quick fire type answers on the other dozen or so questions that I have. All right, question number one. How do you structure your deals, ask Ronnie. Uh, we structure our deals a little bit differently than a traditional syndication. I've seen two different ways that, that um, deals can be structured. One is, you know, you go get a bank loan and then you bring in the investors and I've seen people just pay those investors like six to 10% annualized and then you refinance, pay off those investors and then the operator keeps 100% of the equity. That's good. Um, very good for the operator. The dilemma becomes um, if somebody dangles an 11% carrot in front of those investors' faces, those investors are running the other way. There's not a lot of loyalty built with those investors. On the other side is a traditional syndication. I've seen a traditional syndication structured where typically the investors who bring the down payment capital get around 70% of the deal, and then the operating partner who actually found the deals, raising the money, signing on the loan, uh, renovating the property, all that kind of stuff, gets about 30% of the deal. Seems like a better deal for the investors. The difference is, in a traditional syndication, the operating partner typically takes a lot of fees to uh, you know, balance out the lack of equity that they're getting. So they'll take an acquisition fee, an asset management fee, a loan sponsorship fee, capital raising fee, capital events fee, which is like a refinance fee, or disposition fee uh, whenever the property sells. So all of a sudden, uh, they're getting feed and they're feeing the deal almost to death. I've seen it happen before. Uh, and then the investor's getting paid after all those different fees. So although on paper it looks more advantageous, it's kind of a tricky way, um, or it can be, right? A tricky way uh, to entice investors and then the operating partner feed the deal uh, like crazy. I like being in the same boat, rowing in the same direction as the investors and making sure everybody's interests are aligned. So I've kind of taken a hybrid of the two of these. Uh, in most of my projects, I'll go and get a bank loan for 80% of the money. Let's call it a $10 million deal. And let's say I'm into it for around 7 million bucks. That's about average what my cost basis is, around 70% of that stabilized value. So if I'm all in, for $7 million and I get an 80% loan from a bank, that means they're gonna give me about $5.5 million. That means I need to go and raise $1.5 million from my investors. So I'll go and get that bank loan and then I'll go to the investors, we'll raise that $1.5 million by typically paying a preferred return, which is like a fixed return on their money. Uh, well, it's fixed in, in my deals, right? In a traditional syndication, that's only paid if the property's cash flowing. In my deals, we pay a preferred return regardless of the property's performance because typically we're buying a value add project that we know that we can stabilize and get cash flowing and, and producing within about 12 to 18 months. So it's very predictable what our uh, holding costs are going to be. So we'll pay a fixed return, typically in that eight to 10% range um, to the investors. And then our goal is essentially the Burr method. I structure deals um, because my business model is, is the Burr, which is buy, renovate, rent, refinance, and then hold it long term. I don't like the transactional side of real estate, so we wanna hold long term. So the goal is uh, buy it, renovate it, put good tenants in place, put good management in place, and that whole process can take you know, 24, 36 months to stabilize a deal, and then we go back to the bank and they'll give us a 70% loan on the new value, which is now $10 million. So they give us 7 million bucks in the new loan. That allows me to pay off the bank loan of 5.5. It allows me to pay back the investors of 1.5. And now it's just long-term debt in play, right? We've taken all of our chips off the table. Investors have gotten paid back in full. That allows us to now hold onto the property, right? Our back's not up against the wall. We don't have to make any decisions because we need to pay somebody back because everybody's already paid back. And in that scenario, our investors maintain their ownership equity in that property forever. So even though they've gotten all their money off the table, we usually pay our investors somewhere in the 20 to 30% equity on top of that preferred return. They'll keep about, let's call it a quarter of the equity in the deal forever. 
So they get 25% of refinance proceeds, of cash flows, of depreciation, of appreciation, principal pay down, any future equity growth that's created in that property, the investors are entitled to. So that's on top of the eight to 10% annualized that they had on their money while their money was invested. When their money comes back off the table, they're no longer earning that, right? Because their money's no longer invested, but they still maintain this equity and they get percentage of all the refi proceeds and cash flows and all the other benefits. So it allows us to really build a lot of loyalty with our investors and they see us as long-term partners. And typically when we give them their money back, their first question is, where's the next deal, right? Let's redeploy and how much velocity can I get on my money? That's the key. So you can take our model because we can turn over the money faster, we can give the investors a better return than typically in a traditional syndication or somebody who's paying them a fixed rate, which is why we have a lot of return investors. All right, next question. Zach's asking, how do you effectively manage units from a market that you don't live in? I love this question, right? Because a lot of th people think that it needs to be in my own backyard. I need to be able to go and see it and touch it and feel it. And I think it's good to start in your own backyard so you can get experience in that. Um, but I think you end up owning a job if you manage your own properties and asset management, you're there. By investing in out of state projects, it's forced me to think more like a business owner. What processes do I need to put in place? What people do I need to put in place? What key performance indicators, KPIs, do I need to review on a weekly and monthly basis in order to ensure that the property's moving in the right direction? So it's not that difficult to manage. It's actually easier to manage and own a business that way. I don't typically buy small deals out of state or away from my own backyard. We want usually about 100 doors or more, and that allows for efficiencies in management. So now we can have an on-site manager, on-site maintenance, on-site leasing, and then we take those on-site personnel, we layer it with third-party management who handles the bookkeeping, and you know, if somebody quits or gets fired, they would handle hiring somebody new to come in, um, and they would step in if there is a void ever that, that occurs. Um, and they, they ensure that things keep on moving forward. And then my team, who works remotely, headquartered out of Cleveland, Ohio, is layered on top of that. And they're jumping on a phone call with both the on-site management and the third-party management on a weekly basis to, again, measure those KPIs and ensure that everything's moving forward and the property's getting better and better, occupancy's increasing, renovations are moving along on time, on budget, and collections are where they need to be. Next question. This kind of goes back to deal structure. Robert's asking, how can you raise 100% of the equity portion for your deals? Is that even possible? And the answer is yes. It's actually, in commercial real estate, is very different than residential real estate lending. Um, it's actually assumed that you're going to go out and raise outside capital from outside investors to bring them into your deal. The bank doesn't expect you to downstroke the entire check for the down payment on this deal. A lot of times they'd like to see you have some skin in the game in addition to you know personally guaranteeing the loan, put a little bit of cash in, but it's okay and it's assumed that you're gonna go out and raise money outside. So like I had mentioned earlier, we, we pay a fixed return on their investment while their money's in, invested. Then they get it back typically, typically in about a 36 month timeline. And then from there, our investors maintain equity forever. So it's really not that difficult. Uh, the more people we tell about how we raise money and what we do and how we do it and they see our experience level and uh, success story after success story and deal after deal that we've done, um, you know, it's just, it's just getting the, the word out there. Don't be a super secret agent about raising money and what you do because the more people you tell, the more seeds that you plant, the more money you'll be able to raise and the more people you'll be able to help, right? The reason we have so many people investing with us is because what we offer and the returns that we offer and the long-term equity growth that we offer beats everything else, every other option that they have out there. You know, it's safer, it's more tangible, it's got better tax benefits and tax advantages. You got upside equity growth, you got principal pay down, you have cash flow, potentially non-taxable refinance proceeds. There's a lot of benefits. And it's backed by something that's a, that's, a, that's a fixed asset, something that's tangible that you can see, touch, and feel. And one of the safest investments in the entire world, if not the safest investment, as long as it's operated right by the right people. Uh, I don't know if anything that 
can produce the returns, the tax advantages, and the security and safety that real estate can. So I feel like we have a responsibility to go out and share our opportunity with as many people as possible because they can build more wealth for their family if they invest in our projects. So uh, you gotta adopt that mindset. Know that what you've got is better than anything else that they're comparing it to right now and make sure that you're going out there and feel an obligation to go out and share this opportunity with folks. All right, next question. Darius asks, do you have a preferred target for your all-in cap rate? Like what is your NOI on your all-in cost? It's also called an unleveraged yield uh, at the time of acquisition. Darius, great question. Um, so this can get a little bit complex, but I'm gonna try to keep it simple. Um, a lot of people look at apartment buildings and commercial real estate and they look at what is it currently performing at, right? What's the income minus the expenses equals the net operating income, right? How much money's left at the end of the day? And then they value it based on a multiple of that number. Uh, that's, that's good because it gives you a starting point, but to me, that's not the number I'm focused on. Let me give you an example. If you were to go and flip a house do you care about what the house looks like now or what it could look like and what it could sell for after it's fully renovated and all cleaned up and back on the market? You care about the after repair value of it. Same thing with me. I'm looking for the after repair value on an apartment building. So I'm looking at where can I increase the income? Where can I decrease the expenses? What can I increase the net operating income to? And then I take a multiple of that number and that gives me the, my after repair value or stabilized value. And then I subtract out whatever discount I'm looking for on the deal. You know, I, I gotta get paid because I'm, gonna, I'm the one creating all the value there uh, for me and my investors. So we've subtract out our discount and then we subtract out whatever the renovation costs and any sort of holding costs are. And then it's left, that leaves us with our maximum allowable offer on that deal. So it's the same kind of formula looking at the after repair value and then backing out your discount, backing out your holding costs, backing out your construction costs, and coming up with a maximum allowable offer. And uh, you know the difference in what does today's cap rate perform, that's only gonna dictate how much in carrying costs you have to set aside for this project, right? Because technically, if you're buying something that's gonna be a new construction project, your, your going in cap rate is zero because there's no revenue coming in. So you have to then uh, uh, calculate in whatever your holding costs are going to be until this thing is built. You get certi certificate of occupancy and you, uh, you can fill start filling up the property with rent paying tenants. A great question. All right, next one. Kevin asks, I have close to 200 acres of commercial real estate in the middle of a major city in North Carolina, but I don't know any investors in that area to make a go of turning the property into a cash generating machine. What should I do? Uh, good question. So every time you get into a new asset class and into a new area, one of the first things that I would do, a go-to strategy to find buyers in that area, would be gain access to like the MLS and figure out who's buying those kinds of properties in that area. For example, if you're uh, selling land in Cleveland, Ohio, I would go and pull up Cleveland, Ohio MLS or contact a realtor friend, give them 100 bucks, 200 bucks in order to pull this list. And they can pull all cash buyers or all buyers of land in Cleveland in this zip code or wherever you're looking for um, and get a list of who all those buyers are, at least their names. Then you can either skip trace those names or you can go to like the Secretary of State website and look up who the LLC, like registered agent is and try to figure out who that is. Look them up on, on uh, social media, see if you can find their, their name on Google and, and their info and their address and their phone number and all that kind of stuff. And you can do a little bit more digging and to figure out who these buyers of vacant land are in your town. That's the first thing that I would do is go and gain access to the MLS, pull up all, all cash buyers or all buyers of land that kind of fit that size in that area over the past five to 10 years, I'd make that list and I would reach out to every single one of those people because that is gonna be the lowest hanging fruit. They're already familiar with the area, they already like land deals, and you're checking a couple of boxes right out of the gate. So that's the first thing I would do. Kevin's other question says, uh, my other biggest hang up is finding investor friendly contractors to do the rehabs on the properties I've purchased. Yeah, I think if you're doing single family stuff, uh, 
you know, I think we all go through this like progression of graduating from being a realtor to wholesaling to flipping to owning single family rentals to small multis to larger apartment buildings and other commercial real estate. Just like investors go through that life cycle, I think uh, contractors do too and management companies do too and they all kind of progress out. So do private money lenders even. And so contractors, instead of you got you know, your boy Billy Bob in the back of a pickup truck who's, who breaks down on the way to work every single day and he shows up at 11.30 instead of 8 o'clock in the morning when he's supposed to, like that's the kind of clientele you're dealing with in certain areas of single family. When you get into commercial real estate, you're dealing with a more sophisticated business person, right? They're not just good at swinging a hammer. They're good at running a business. Now they can get government contracts and large commercial deals and things along of, of, of that sort uh, because they know how to manage people. They know how to put processes in place. They know how to put checks and balances in place. They know how to get the financing and secure credit uh, through vendors and suppliers and, and material uh, providers. As far as like attracting them to your deals, you got to figure out what are other people paying them. You either got to pay them more or you say, hey, aren't you tired of the transactional stuff? Maybe you can go and make your transactional fees from those projects over there. If you come in to do this project and you do it at cost, then I'll kick you some equity in the deal. Sounds pretty fair to me. And that allows you to get into deals at a lower cost basis that other people can't and maybe make some deals out of things that you couldn't have otherwise, that other people can't otherwise, especially in a hot market like this. So definitely something to consider is partnering up with a general contractor who's willing to do things at cost in order for a piece of the equity in the project. Vina asks, what are you paying your CPA for K1s? I have hundreds of K1s for our investor database. Um, yeah, our, our CPA just does our you know, income taxes on an on a entity basis. It's usually a couple thousand dollars uh, per year and it includes sending out all the K-1s. Um, we use a software called InvestNext, which allows us to just kind of upload all the K-1s right there. They're all digitally uh, provided to our investors. It's nice and easy. And um, if they ever need access to any other documents, any other reports or anything like that, they just log into that portal. And it's a lot less phone calls and interaction on our part. Jacqueline has a question. She says, my biggest hang up is feeling like it's out of my league. Like I have to pay my dues in the single family game first uh, and not really knowing what to do when I find a deal. You got to get educated. The first thing is going out and learning this stuff. You know, there's countless books, um, YouTube videos like this one that can show you how to underwrite a deal. Uh, we got Commercial Empire. Come out to Commercial Empire. It's uh, less than $1,000 to learn how to find off-market direct-to-seller deals, how to underwrite those deals, go through the whole due diligence process so you don't get your legs taken out, how to raise private money from equity investors, how to source and secure financing, how to operate with project management and property management and asset management, and then what the, all, all the different exit strategies look like in the commercial real estate game. So plug in a commercial empire, we go through all of that stuff in order to help you out and really give you the confidence. You know, I mean, it's, I, I understand it's, it seems like a very complex and convoluted space, but the reality is it's, it's simpler than what we build it up to be in our head. And we try to simplify it to a way where really anybody can understand it. And especially somebody who has some background in real estate, like I know Jacqueline does, uh, you can really catch it and run with it in our three day virtual course, Commercial Empire. So check out commercialempire.com if you have some interest in that. Chris has a good question here. How do I build up a portfolio while working a full-time job to support a family? First of all, commend your work ethic, commend that um, you wanna do something bigger, better, provide more for your family and make a bigger impact. So uh, what I would do is I'd figure out not just what can you add, we're gonna talk about that in a second, but first, what can you subtract from your current life? Meaning, do you sit in front of the TV and watch television for two hours every night? Some, something that's not pouring into yourself. Um, can you work remotely instead of going to the office every single day, maybe a couple days a week, you can save an hour of commute time. I'm trying to figure out where we can save you some time uh, in order to give you time to go and work on your commercial real estate portfolio. Are you cutting your grass for an hour and a half every single week and you can pay somebody to do that for 40 bucks 
and instead go to uh, make a lot more money than the forty dollars that um, you were saving because you decided to cut your own grass. You know, thinking like that, how can you automate a few things that are going on in your life in order to buy time back, or eliminate some things in your life in order to get some time back? And then I would dedicate those hours to learning commercial real estate. And you don't have to learn everything. Commercial real estate's more of a team sport, so you don't have to be Superman, you don't have to be Wonder Woman. When you come into commercial real estate, figure out one thing that works really, really well for you, and that fits your, uh, your skill set, your talent level, and uh, uh, your personality and behavioral type. Figure out what that is. Maybe that's just finding deals. Spend all your time and become an expert at one thing. So if you can go and, and, and become an expert at finding deals, and you spend all your free time finding deals, you hand it off to somebody else that knows what they're doing, knows how to execute on that, and you say, hey, either pay me a fee or kick me some equity in that deal, then it allows you to get involved in a deal and not have to operate it. That way you can do something one time and get paid in equity forever. That's a pretty sweet position to be in. Maybe you have access to private money. So go out, raise some capital for a project, help out with maybe some of the capital management, maybe bring some of your own money to the deal, and that can allow you to get involved in a project and earn some additional equity that way. Uh, from an operations standpoint, that's, you're gonna need a little bit more time uh, if you're a project manager or a property manager or a contractor or something along those lines where you need to be kind of on site on a more um, active basis. So if I'm you, I'd figure out how to find deals or raise money and then bring that to active operators and get involved that way. Either that or passively invest your own money until you get to a point where your residual income um, makes you comfortable enough to leave your full-time job, and that way you can jump into real estate on a full-time basis. Fred asks, hey, would you be willing to sell or finance any of your stuff? He goes, you hold back the note while I take the landlord, while I take over the landlord part, uh, creates true passive income for you, and um, preferably one that's free and clear. Good question, right? If you don't ask, you don't know what the answer is. I've actually sold off a bunch of my property, and many times it's with some sort of seller financing. So instead of you having to bring you know, 20 or 30% down um, on several deals, I've had people bring maybe like 10 to 15% down, and then I carry back the other 10 to 15% as like either a note or an equity investor of some sort, and then they would assume my existing financing on it. Uh, another way that you could do it is through like an installment contract, which is kind of like like a car title, right? You don't get the car title until you pay off the car loan in full, um, and that's when you get the title. Um, so I've, I've done it before where I maintain title to the property and then give somebody um, ownership rights, kind of, through an installment contract. They take over the responsibility, the liability, the headaches, the management, all that kind of stuff. They make a payment to me, I make a payment to my bank, and then when they refinance out me in full, that's when my bank gets paid off in full too, and then that's when they take title to the property. So it just kind of depends, but yeah, I mean, I do that all the time. I've actually sold off most of my smaller stuff now and any like the C-class stuff that um, I'm just trying to like kind of trim my portfolio up, and now we just, we're hanging on to the, the more B-class and A-class properties and looking to scale up that side of things. <laughs> Brian says, I don't want any residential units. I only want commercial tenants. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Uh, there's different strokes for different folks, right? There's benefits to commercial. And one of those benefits is you don't have residential tenants living in the property all the time. You have commercial tenants backed by commercial guarantees. And if the property gets messed up, you know, there's usually pretty deep pockets that can uh, take care of that. Uh, the downside is if you have an office building, guess what, you would have gotten rattled over the COVID pandemic, right? Because everybody's leaving offices and starting to work from home. If you're in retail, retail can be great, but guess what, Amazon is in the business of taking retail out of brick and mortar and making it all e-commerce. You know, then there's uh, self-storage. Self-storage is awesome. I own a few self-storage facilities also, uh, but it's, it can be overbuilt. And as soon as it gets overbuilt, all of a sudden, all occupancy across the entire market ends up dropping and it, can, it cannibalizes itself. Residential real estate is one of the only things, it's actually the only asset class that the federal government, HUD, Housing and Urban Development, has mandated that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have to continuously lend on multifamily real estate regardless of what happens to the market. 
They don't have to do that with any of the other asset classes. Financing was completely shut down for hotels when COVID hit. You could not get a, a loan if you wanted to go buy a hotel for 30 cents on the dollar. You had to go get private money, hard money of some sort. There were no institutional lenders who would lend to you on that. So be aware of uh, every asset class, what the benefits are of that asset class, what the downside risks are of that asset class, and realize that every asset class has goods and has bads. So you need to figure out what works best for you, your personality, your strengths, and, um, and stay away from things that, that lean on your weaknesses and really just become an expert at whatever that asset class is. So regardless of what happens with the economy, you still can operate successfully uh, no matter what's going on with the market. Chris says, hey, I'm having trouble finding good deals that don't have 20 flippers and daisy chains happening in the middle. You know, adding $10,000 each for, for doing nothing and ending up with a piece of shit for top dollar. So, yeah, I get it. There's a lot of that stuff going on. There's a lot of daisy chains going on where people just say, hey, they forward an email and say, oh yeah, I want 3% fee on this $70 million deal for forwarding an email. And that person doesn't even have it under contract. They never did any due diligence on it. They don't know anything about the deal other than, let me forward an email and expect a big chunk of money. I can tell you this, I've done thousands and thousands of deals. I've done, uh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds in the, on the single family side and have transacted, I don't know, it's about 6,000 doors, maybe more, on the, uh, on the multifamily side. Never once have I ever closed a deal that had multiple daisy chainers. If I wasn't direct to the exclusive listing broker or if I wasn't direct to the seller, then the deal didn't get done. And that's not because I wasn't willing to do the deal. I've worked deals that were through daisy chainers. The problem is there's too many hands in the cookie jar and too many people looking out for their own benefit instead of looking out for the benefit of getting the deal done. And that kills the deal, right? Because all of a sudden now nobody gets paid because you cannot communicate clearly seller and buyer in order to get something to the finish line. So I've never once been able to close a deal that way. So now I won't even look at deals unless somebody sends it to me and they have it under contract or they are the seller or they are the exclusive listing broker of the deal. Don't waste your time otherwise. Instead, go directly to the seller yourself. You know, do outbound direct mail, do outbound phone calls, call for rent by owner signs, reach out to the building department locally and see who's got violations on their properties, look for delinquent taxes. Like there's a thousand different things that you can do to find uh, landlords and building owners. You go and talk to them. Don't wait for some daisy chainer to bring you a deal. Go out there and actively search for it yourself. Talk to the seller, talk to the, uh, the exclusive listing agent and negotiate a great deal. Don't rely on daisy chainers. You, those deals never have worked for me. And we'll close out with this one. Jonathan asked, what are the best practices for building a strong team? Uh, great question. I would say that building a team has undoubtedly been one of the top three things that I did that have given me just astronomic growth over the past several years. It's tough though, right? Like when you're getting started, you can't afford these six figure salaries. How do you figure that, how do you, how do you compensate these people? And one of the things that I kind of figured out early on is you can joint venture on a deal by deal basis with other operating partners. And, and you can say, hey, let's go take down one, two, three Main Street. I'm gonna bring this value so I, I earn this much equity. You bring this value so you earn that much equity. And let's see how it is to work together. And you take down that one deal. If it goes well, you take down another deal. If it goes well, you take down five more deals. And eventually, after a couple years of working together, doing good deals, probably doing some bad deals, you get to see how people interact and how they react and how they proact and how they respond to good deals and bad deals. And if it makes sense, if you like that and, and really values align and visions align, then you can start partnering up with people. Give them equity, you get some equity, and build it out that way. Start taking down more and more deals and then eventually you have more money and now you can start hiring people, right? And then that way with your equity, you can start hiring people, take on that overhead if you want and then keep more equity for yourself if you want. Uh, I do a little bit of both, right? I have a lot of amazing talents and then I have a lot of people on profit share, a lot of people on revenue share and a lot of people who are equity partners in different deals or businesses that we, that we work in. So. Um, that's a couple different ways that you can attract A players into your business. And I can assure you, 
once you get eight players in your business, your growth will be astronomic. So the sooner you can do that, the better for you and your business. So that was another round of questions that I got that I wanted to address for you guys. Hopefully this helps. Hopefully it gives you some insights into growing your real estate business, growing your commercial real estate portfolio, and growing your team, and growing your lifestyle. And if there's a question in here that I have not answered yet, uh, shoot me a direct message or put it in the comment section below and I'll make sure I'll do another video here in a few weeks or a couple months once we accumulate another dozen or so questions and we'll uh, uh, get all those answered for you too. So. Uh, give me a like if you would, hit the notification bell because I got more of these videos coming out every single week that will provide a ton of value for you. And if you're getting a ton of value out of it, do me a favor and share it with somebody else who would get some value. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time and a lot of money putting these videos together. All I ask is that uh, it gets exposure, right? So if you're getting some good value out of it, do me a favor and just share it on social media, shoot it in an email out to uh, some other people that you know that would also get some value out of it and I'd really appreciate it. So. Until next time, appreciate you, be your best.